One of the remarkable things about Iceland, and it does have many remarkable things, is its literary tradition and the incredible treasure trove of the Icelandic sagas, written in the 12th and 13th centuries, which put down in a unique body of manuscripts the history of Iceland's settlement a couple of centuries earlier and effectively wrote down the story of the Vikings themselves, including their myths, their legends and their gods. I'm Helen Shaw and this is Mother's Blood, Sister's Songs, the story of how the genetics of Iceland reveals its Gaelic roots and Irish mothers. So to find out a bit more about the sagas, Linda Buckley and I sat down with Dr. Emily Lethbridge, whose field is the sagas at the University of Iceland in Reykjavik. Now, Emily is an English woman who, a bit like Lizzie Boyle, has a PhD from Cambridge University in Anglo-Saxon, Norse and Celtic studies. And she's now settled in Iceland and raising her young family of two daughters there. My name's Emily Lethbridge. I'm currently a research lecturer in the Department for Name Studies at the Albany Magnusson Institute for Icelandic Research in Reykjavik, Iceland. And my background, I have a PhD in Old Norse Literature from the University of Cambridge. And I moved to Iceland permanently in 2011. So I've been here since then. And what led you to this area? How did you become fascinated by the sagas? Well, when I was studying as an undergrad, I was learning, amongst other things, Old Icelandic, Old Norse, also a bit of Old Irish. Then there were history papers, medieval literature papers, manuscript studies. And for me, it was it was the sagas that just gripped the imagination, really, from the start. And then, having finished my PhD, I actually... Um, decided it was time to do something about the fact I could not speak a word of modern Icelandic. I could read the language, or at least the medieval language, but I couldn't speak a word. So I used some of a period of time when I was a research fellow at Cambridge to actually come and work on a dairy farm in the north of Iceland. And while I was milking the cows, I started trying to get my tongue around the (laughs) impossible Icelandic, yeah, the sound of modern Icelandic and, yeah, picked up modern Icelandic initially in that context. And that then opened all kinds of doors to me because I was in the middle of the country and I began to see around me place names, names of farms, names of other places that I recognised because they were in the written sagas that I had, that I knew already from the, from reading. Mm. So suddenly I could connect, or I began to see how you could connect these stories with the landscapes and became very interested in the, the relationship between these stories and the landscape and place names. That's an interesting parallel because I actually grew up on a dairy farm myself. Aha. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, for, for those who are new to it, how would you explain the Icelandic sagas? What, what are they? They're prose narratives. Some are shorter, some are longer. They're set in Iceland from the late 9th century to the early well, 11th century, really. So they span several centuries. They describe, um, amongst other things, the first settling of Iceland by people who hailed from Norway, some from Sweden, some from Denmark, primarily Norway, and also many Norsemen who came to Iceland via the British Isles, so via the Norse colonies in northern Scotland and Ireland. And some of them are very biographical in focus, so they take outlaws or they take poets, they take powerful chieftains and follow their lives. Some of them are more kind of broader in scope, um, and they tell the stories of families or family dynasties and local communities. And what does it tell us about those first settlers? I suppose one, one thing that's perhaps important to, to point out from the beginning is that they, the people who were writing these sagas down were those who were, they were the, the ones with the power in the 13th 
century, which is the, the century when these oral stories were being turned into written literature. So we do have a perspective from above rather than from below. I think first and foremost, they're, you know, they're family stories. So they're, they're 13th century Icelanders looking back on their family origins and the circumstances in which their ancestors came to Iceland and built new lives for themselves in a new country. But they also have, you know, we have people from all levels of society who feature in different ways in these stories. So we have both those who are said to have been descended from powerful chieftains, families in Norway or, or, or even royal families, and then, you know, farmers and and slaves too so people hailing from different backgrounds and different different levels of society all, all coming together and building new lives together and you know it's the writing of it's the writing of iceland's story so both from a local perspective and from a national perspective and the focus from one saga to another varies with regard to you know how local or how national in scope they are. And is there mention of Ireland and the Irish within this? Yeah, absolutely. There's Ireland and, and the Irish feature in a number of different sagas in, in different ways. So we have some characters in the sagas who come to Iceland via Ireland, such as Unnur in Laxdala Saga, and she's married to Olavur, who's a chieftain in, in Dublin, uh, loses her husband spends some time in Scotland and then sails to Iceland to build a new life for her and her, her children, grandchildren in Iceland. So characters and connections with the Irish world and often, well, in some cases, female characters who have been captured and taken into slavery and moved, brought over to, to Ireland. And I think you've touched upon that there with Mel Corca, because I think that's mm. one of the most fascinating aspects of the, the Laxdala saga. Um, could you maybe just tell us a little bit about, about that story? Mel Corca, she is taken in, in captivity, hails from Ireland, and Laxdala saga tells the story of how Herskuldur, who is a, a powerful character in the, in the west of Iceland, in the Dalish region, he goes abroad, he's in Norway, and he uh, is at a, an assembly, and there's a, a tent where women are being sold, slaves, women who've been captured and brought from Ireland or other places to Norway, sold into slavery. And he likes the look of one of them, and he buys this woman for three marks of silver, and the man who is selling these women tells Herskuldr that he, there's one thing she should he should know about this woman and that is that she can't speak, she has no voice. But Herskuldr buys her anyway, takes her back with him to Iceland and keeps her as his mistress or his concubine. And he is already married, so his wife, naturally Jórun, back in Iceland, is far from delighted at this turn of affairs and the two women as might be expected don't get on very well um, eventually Melkorka is moved to her own farm by Höskuldur and she shortly after arriving in Iceland has a son who's called Olavur and so this is one of the family lines that are really important to to the story that's told in Laxdala Saga. So Melkorka she has the son called Olavur, and Olavur in, in turn has a son called Kjartan, who then becomes key to the, the story to Laxdala Saga later on, when he falls in love with a local woman called Gudrun, Osvifa's daughter, and she falls in love with him as well. And then the, the great kind of desperate love story develops at that stage. But with regard to slavery, it's it's interesting maybe to note too that Olavur, when it's time for him to marry, he marries a woman called Thorgerðr, who's the daughter of Eitl Skallgrimsson. And Thorgerðr at first is quite upset with her father. She's quite upset at the, the prospect of being married off to somebody who is the son of a slave. 
albeit the son of an enslaved Irish princess. But Melkorka, people, when she's introduced into the saga, people immediately remark on the fact that she, you know, she clearly is something more than just a slave because, you know, she behaves in such a way that to suggest that, you know, her origins are different. And, and it's discovered that she can, in fact, talk. She's not, she's not without a voice when Haskeldur overhears her talking with her young son, Olavur, outside nearby the farmhouse and he realizes that she it's not that she can't speak it's that she's just refused to speak because of these circumstances and Melkorka has taught Oliver Irish so when Oliver in turn goes off on a search for his origins um, and gains great fame and renown outside of Iceland, he sails to Ireland and can converse with the, the Irish who he meets and manages to meet his Irish grandfather and stays as part of his grandfather's retinue for some time and, and is highly honoured by Myrkjartan. Um, maybe you could tell us a little bit about your work connected to the mapping of landscape within the sagas. Sure. So first of all, I was working on this dairy farm in the north of Iceland and I, and I noticed, or I just became aware for the first time of how many of the place names in the sagas that I had been reading were just still present in the, the modern day landscape that I was becoming familiar with. So that was the starting point for me, just this connection between these stories and between the physical places that I was exploring and, and moving through. And this, of course, for Icelanders is nothing remarkable, but for someone coming from outside, it was really mind blowing initially and sometimes still just, you know, this sense of continuity in terms of stories and landscapes over a period of a thousand years or so. In fact, of course, the more I began to look into it, the more I began to realize that this relationship between story and place and landscape and in some ways, I mean, this, this, what I was experiencing was by no means new. People from Britain and elsewhere all around the world have been coming to Iceland from you know, the 19th century onwards, inspired by having read the sagas and wanting to see the sites of the sagas for themselves. And some of these earlier visitors were those who were working at translating the sagas. And for them, it was really important to get a sense for the landscape themselves, because the sagas as a body of narrative landscape is absolutely key to how their action plays out, but there is very little overt or lengthy description of landscape. So it's all kind of implicit and you have to know the place names, kind of know how the place names lie out around the landscape and also maybe sometimes what the place names mean to really appreciate the agency of landscape within these stories too. So People such as William Morris were coming to Iceland in the 19th century and having similarly kind of mind-blowing experiencing experiences with regard to this perception of continuity from past to present. And so I, I kind of, when I first arrived in Iceland and was exploring these landscapes myself through the lens of the sagas, I, in many ways I was kind of having similar experiences to, to these 19th century tourists. And was it important for you to come here? I mean, did it feel like there was an immediate resonance when you we first landed here after your years of study? Because you've built a life here now, of course. Yeah, you're, it you're did. Here. It did. For me, it was the place names that kind of made this landscape so resonant from the start. And the more, the better my Icelandic became, the more I could understand the, the place names. I did feel this affinity with the, the landscape from just really early on when I when I first came here. And I'm sure partly I had, I felt that, I had that sense of affinity because I knew these stories. And learning the language, of course, was a, a way in as well. And working on a farm, of course, was a, a way in just, you know, throwing myself into that and trying to, to kind of become part of a local society. And then moving to Reykjavik and continuing working on research at the Alpenstopnen Institute here, knowing the sagas, the kind of saga spilled into my everyday life in so many different ways. While I was training with the, the rescue service, the mountain rescue service, for example, and 
part of that training involved there are a lot of expeditions to the mountains and sort of camping for several nights and walking and learning kind of emergency survival techniques and often wherever it was where we were in the countryside you know I, I knew the place names or I I could connect some episodes from some sagas with wherever it was that we were so I could actually you know tell some of these stories from the sagas for for those the others who were training training with me and I could kind of animate the landscape or or kind of orientate myself within that landscape because I knew these stories yeah you know in some ways I can identify with characters in the sagas like Melkorka more than 10 years ago because I feel the tug of having family in two places. So Melkorka in Laxtyla saga is when Olav comes back to, to Iceland, Melkorka is delighted that her son has found uh, his grandfather and, and she's most of all you know, delighted that he's met her old nurse, but she's very disappointed that Olaf didn't bring this old nurse back with him to Iceland so she could be reunited with her. And I kind of, yeah, I, you, I think when, you, when you've grown up in one country or one place and you move to another country as an adult and start a family there, there'll always be that, that tug, um, that emotional tug, because you've left people that are dear to you behind but you know I have people who are dear to me and who now it's my responsibility to bring up here in this country and I'm you know I I, I couldn't really be happier with my choice of new home not least <laughs> the time of recording when all kinds of chaos is going on in the British in Westminster Iceland feels like a much safer place to to be and it's a wonderful place to have a family and bring up children well, it's a place where, you know, probably one of the best places in the world to be a woman. There's a female prime minister currently. There has been a female president. These women have been and are hugely respected figures in society, incredible role models. So for me, I'm now the mother of two girls, and it's fantastic to bring up these girls, you know, when... When you have these role models, not just in, in present times, but you know, going back for decades too. But having said that, I'm also a female immigrant. And even with the, the privilege that I have, and even with the, the ability to talk the language, you still come up against, you still find yourselves in situations where you have to fight a bit or, or kind of assert your right to be heard and, you know, say things two or three times so that for your voice to be heard rather than you know making the point once but I think there's there's a lot a lot about Icelandic society and the position the roles that women play in it that many other countries you know, around the world really can learn from certainly And that's Dr. Emily Lethbridge at the Arne Magnusson Institute for Icelandic Studies at the University of Iceland in Reykjavik. Now, I've added some links to Emily's work into the text box of the podcast itself, and we've put some video of our chat with Emily on the website mothersbloodsisterssongs.com, as well as a beautiful short film made during Emily's research, her mapping of the sagas through the landscape of Iceland, and that's called Memories of Old Awake. So do check it out. It's gorgeous. Thanks for listening.